Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for one of the very last panels, Legal Protection for Practitioners. Um, today, we will explore the legal frameworks applicable to practitioners working with patients at risk of harming others. I'm Matt Divelbus, a partner at Jones Day here in Pittsburgh, and I'll be the moderator for today's panel. Before I introduce the panel, let me very briefly set the stage. Here in Pennsylvania, in, less in the span of less than a year, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court issued two decisions on practitioners' liability for the acts of their patients. In the first decision, the court held that a practitioner could be held liable where the patient threatened to shoot his neighbor and did so because the practitioner failed to identify and warn the neighbors who were 20 residents who lived on the same floor of an apartment building as the patient. In the second decision, the court held that a practitioner could not be held liable where the practitioner recognized that the patient needed involuntary, immediate, inpatient psychiatric, psychiatric treatment, but failed to follow through on the steps necessary to have the patient receive that treatment. Just a few days later, that patient took two handguns to a psychiatric hospital here in Pittsburgh, killed one person, and wounded several others before he was killed by a police officer. What we see from just these two cases is that, is that the liability risks to practitioners are real, that the need for disclosure is real, but that it's all very complicated. So we've put together a distinguished panel of attorneys to help sort through it all. First, we have Stephanie Chow, an attorney with Carlton Fields in Los Angeles, a litigator and a Southern California rising star. Stephanie's practice focuses on complex business litigation and business formation matters. Prior to venturing into private practice, Stephanie spent a year as a special assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of California. Ben Stearns is an attorney with Carlton Fields in Tallahassee. Ben regularly counsels insurance companies and defends them in coverage litigation. Ben has been named to the best lawyers in America's one to watch list in corporate governance and compliance. And he serves as the vice chair of the American Bar Association's Government Operations and Liability Subcommittee. Both Ben and Stephanie previously presented to the McCain Institute as part of their legal liability series, discussing many of the issues before us today. If I were to list all of Richard Aborn's roles and accomplishments, we would have no time to actually get to work. So both he and you will forgive me for this very abbreviated version. Richard is the president of the Citizens Crime Commission of New York, where under his leadership, the commission has been instrumental in the passage of significant legislation in New York and has launched the Pre Predictive Prevention Lab, an incubator aimed at developing, as the name suggests, predictive prevention solutions. He works with police departments, criminal justice agencies, companies, and others across the globe on criminal justice policy, violence reduction, and rule of law issues. In his spare time, he's the managing partner of Constantine Cannon, a law firm with more than 70 lawyers in New York, London, San Francisco, and Washington. Now, because this is a panel of lawyers, I feel obligated to include some legal disclaimers before we get started. First, all of the views expressed here today are those of the speakers and not of our law firms or organizations. Second, and most importantly, nothing we say today should be construed as legal advice. We will be speaking about the applicable laws and rules generally, but one of the things you will hear is that the laws applicable to practitioners vary greatly across the country and certainly around the world. Thus, if you have a specific question about an issue you are facing, it is important that you consult with an attorney who practices in your jurisdiction. So with that introduction, let me turn to Stephanie and Stephanie, could you explain for us some of the ways that liability can arise with regard to mental health professionals working with people tending toward extremist ideologies? Thank you, Matt. And thank you to everyone who's here with us. It is a true pleasure to be here. I've gotten the opportunity to attend a lot of the panels, and it's a true confluence of experts in a lot of different areas. Uh, I'm happy to give you and set the, the stage for a little bit on the framework for legal liability. And it starts with the framework between civil liability and criminal liability. Just by way of background, for those of you who are not attorneys, civil liability is when 
two parties or multiple parties are suing each other um, or one another for what we call damages, monetary relief for the most part. And that's to be contrasted with criminal law, which we won't discuss as much in depth here, but really goes towards writing public, redressing public wrongs. And typically those cases are brought by a prosecution office where the government is uh, seeking a, he's filing a case against a certain defendant, uh, typically involving either imprisonment or a fine or both. And that typically gets brought in either the civil or the, uh, in the state or federal courts. Now within civil liability, there are a couple different areas. Again, there's what we call contract law, and then there's another area called tort law, and this is primarily differentiated by uh, contract law having to do with parties who are, have entered into either a written or oral agreement, and tort law is primarily to impose certain obligations upon certain actors within society based on typically case law, uh, judge-made law. And so within tort law, I know that now it brings us down a different level, uh, what we're primarily going to talk about today is principles of negligence. So that can be boiled down to the question of, can someone who is doing something for the right reason, trying their best to practice in the way that is permissible, and it, can they still be held liable? And that really comes down to the fundamental, fundamental question of, well, what is negligence law? And Across jurisdictions, this varies. However, the general principles in many of the jurisdictions boils down to a few different elements. One being the existence of a duty, two, breach of that duty, then causation, and then, as I mentioned before, damages, which could be primarily monetary, um, but other types of uh, different relief as well. And the fundamental question in any negligence claim is, again, the existence of a duty. And that question is something that is determined on a case-by-case -case basis, but ultimately comes down to the judges who are adjudicating a given case. Whether or not a duty exists in, as to any particular defendant is typically a policy-driven inquiry. And again, that's made by judges. And some of the factors that a judge can look at and determine whether there's an existence of a duty is whether it would be reasonable to impose such a duty on, and on folks of that given uh, nature or that different occupation. Other factors that are included include the existence of potentially imposing limitless liability on that given set of individuals. So, effectively turning that group of individuals into an insurer of their conduct so that every given person who has ever injured could potentially sue. And that would, again, cause limitless liability. So judges, when weighing this calculus, are concerned with particularly making sure that there's a balance of protecting the public from certain conduct, but also not creating uh, insurance-like liability for, for certain categories of, of people. And so how does this manifest in the prevention practitioner space? And it comes up primarily in a couple different areas. And the first one being the duty to control. So the question would be is, does the pre prevention practitioner have a duty to control the patient's actions and what they ultimately could do outside the space of their office. And the answer to that is, as an attorney, would be it depends. Uh, but certainly some courts have taken the view that there's no general duty to control the uh, patient's actions. Um, and particularly one of the and this is not a bright line rule by any means, but one of the factors that, or facts that the judges might look at would be whether or not there is a actual measure of control that's imposed when the practitioner is dealing with the client and the patient. So for instance, inpatient uh, treatment, 
usually there's a, a measure of, okay, this person is in a facility, there's protocols that are in place to keep them from leaving, they either have to sign a waiver or certain things. So in that case, the institution or the practitioner might actually have some ability to control their in and out privileges, and if they exercise that, um, that duty in a way that's uh, below the standard of care, then perhaps there would be some liability. Contrast that with a, an outpatient program where the patient is free to leave and free to go, and um, ultimately, in many circumstances, there isn't a tracking of where that person goes by the practitioner. And in that case, in certain cases, the, judge, uh, the, the courts have held that because there was no ability to control that person, that there's no duty to control. So those two are interrelated. And again, it's not a bright line rule, but um, I think one thing to keep in mind is the more control that you have over the patient, I think the more your obligations to interact with that patient in a responsible way are going to increase. And that really brings us to the, the again, the ultimate issue, which is, is there a general duty to control? And the answer is, um, as a general proposition, no. But of course, the individual facts and, and how much individual interaction and uh, control that a practitioner has over patients or uh, ability to move or do certain things uh, matters. Thank you, Stephanie. I, you know, I know that one of the kind of area of focus among mental health professionals is the duty to warn. And Ben, I was wondering if you could address the duty to warn among health professionals, how that might be a basis for liability, and some things that health professionals might consider and, you know, to mitigate that risk of liability. Sure. Yeah. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. And I want to echo uh, Stephanie's comments, thanking all of you for attending, Jones Day and all of the other sponsors for putting on this conference. This is a really amazing uh, conference with a lot of uh, wonderful speakers, and I think we're honored to be included. Um, jumping off of what Stephanie was saying regarding duty and the duty to control, whereas the duty to control is more likely to come into play in an inpatient setting, the duty to warn, or sometimes is referred to as the duty to protect, is more likely to come into play in an outpatient setting. Those two terms, duty to warn and duty to protect, are, are frequently used interchangeably by uh, some commentators. Some commentators, however, uh, view them as slight variations uh, on a theme, whereas the duty to warn uh, typically is uh, a narrower in that it, it implies that the practitioner, the therapist, the counselor, has a duty to warn the specific identified uh, individual uh, who is being threatened by their patient, whereas the duty to protect offers the practitioner more options as a way to uh, comply with or carry out their duty, such as notifying the police or uh, initiating hospitalization or commitment procedures or, or something like that. Uh, it's, it, these, these are complicated uh, doctrines, and they're complicated to some extent because of how gray uh, they are, and in, in there aren't bright lines. Uh, and they're also complicated by the fact that there is significant variation in how these uh, duty, duty to warn or duty to protect, uh, has been adopted or implemented across the country. Um, Depending on which uh, scholar, commentator you're reading, uh, there are different uh, categorizations or, or, or categorizations of, of how many states have adopted what's referred to as a mandatory duty to warn or duty to protect versus a permissive duty to warn or duty to protect versus no guidance on, on what duty uh, the therapist or counselor uh, may be subject to. Uh, depending on the criteria that the particular scholar is using to categorize the different duties, I've seen anywhere between 25 to 30, 32, 33 states categorized as a mandatory duty to warn with 
between 17 and 22, 23 being considered as having a uh, permissive duty to warn. And then another three to six as having no guidance. Uh, the reason for, or some of the reasons for those different uh, counts are because of the different sources of, of the duties. Uh, a number of states have actually adopted these, these duties uh, by promulgation of a statute, whereas a, another 10 or 11 or so have uh, promulgated the duty via case law, uh, court, court orders, court pronouncements uh, as a result of a uh, legal action. Um, and then still others have not had the issue actually presented to them such that the uh, adoption of the duty would have been considered a holding and therefore binding uh, case law. But there were dicta uh, announced by the court, uh, which is a non, non-binding um, statement of the court uh, in favor of uh, uh, the there being a duty to warn in that particular state. So some, some scholars would count those dicta as, as an indication that that state does, has adopted a duty to warn or duty to protect, and others uh, don't. And then there's you know, a residual number of states, three, three to six, small number, uh, that really don't provide any guidance uh, whatsoever. Uh, so looking at the different duties, uh, mandatory duty uh, typically uh, exists when the therapist has uh, been presented by the patient or client uh, with a threat uh, that of imminent violence or harm directed towards an identifiable person or group and uh, that that threat is capable of being carried out and the uh, patient or client has indicated a willingness to do so. In those particular instances, the, uh, the, the therapist uh, in mandatory duty states has, has a mandatory duty, uh, is required to disclose, to break confidentiality with that patient by either warning the target of the threat or uh, warning police, notifying police, potentially warning or notifying family members, somebody else that could apprise the uh, intended uh, target of the threat. And these targets of threats can be a specific individual, uh, it could be a group of people, it could be a uh, particular place. Um, I saw reference uh, to one case in Vermont actually where uh, the, the duty was triggered by a threat uh, to burn down a neighbor's barn. So in some instances it can even be a threat towards property. Um, the permissive duty as opposed to a mandatory duty, uh, does not require the therapist to uh, issue the warning, either to the police or to the the victim, intended victim, target, um, but merely authorizes them to do so, um, such that if they do break confidentiality or disclose uh, the threat, uh, that they will not be subject to liability as a, as a result of that uh, breaking of the confidence. Um, and uh, it, it protects the therapist for breaking confidentiality in good faith. This, this doctrine is reflected uh, to some extent in the uh, APA, the American Psychiatric Association's Ethical Principles and Code of Conduct. Um, and a, as mentioned, there's a great deal of variety in really every aspect of how these duties are adopted and implemented in the various states, including who is subject to the duty to warn or duty to protect. Um, I believe New York has recently uh, amended, well, actually not that recent, I think the most recent amendment was in 2013, relatively recently amended uh, its statute so as to apply it to Psychologists, psychiatrists, licensed clinical social workers, and mental health counselors. But that's not the case uh, across the country. And all of this stemmed from uh, a a case uh, almost 50 years ago now um, that has become relatively famous. It's it's known as the Tarasov case, and sometimes this duty is referred to as a Tarasov duty, or these are Tarasov warnings. 
uh, which uh, was decided by the California Supreme Court in 1976. And just to give you a kind of a concrete example of how this duty can come into play, um, in that particular case, a student, a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley, I believe, uh, had told his therapist of his fixation with another student and uh, his uh, urge to kill that other student. Um, the therapist told the police, notified the police of this threat uh, directed towards this other student, and the police actually picked up the uh, client who had made the threat. But after interviewing the client, they found that they didn't think he was an actual threat, and they released him. Nobody warned the target of the threat. Uh, nobody warned her family, friends, or anything. And it, it, sadly, he carried out the threat and, and killed the, uh, the other student. Um, on appeal, interestingly, one of the dissents uh, from one of the justices uh, of California Supreme Court mentioned that to, even if we were to find that there was a duty uh, on the part of the therapist to disclose this threat, which was really breaking new ground, um, and, and that's why it's the seminal case that everybody refers to, um, the, there's an argument here that the therapist did so. The therapist told, notified the police, and it was the police that subsequently released the, uh, the patient. Uh, and so whether or not there is a duty, there's an argument that the therapist complied with that duty. However, he found that even so, that that's simply a defense that the uh, therapist could raise um, and wasn't a grounds for dismissing the case outright. Thank you, Ben. Now, we talk a lot about disclosure, and you know, probably everyone in this room or listening has signed a disclosure of your HIPAA rights when visiting the doctor. Um, being lawyers, we might have even read them. You know, how does, how does HIPAA interact with the disclosure obligations, Stephanie? How, how is it that in light of HIPAA and the obligation to keep patient information confidential, that there can still be these disclosures about kind of patient-protected information? Sure. So for those of you who don't know, it's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And primary of the protections that was instituted under the act is uh, the requirement that patient information should remain confidential. Now, there are carve-outs in HIPAA where if there is a serious and imminent harm, then that disclosure it can be made. It's permissive. It's not required, um, which dovetails with the duties under uh, Tarasov and that regime. But those two work in, in conjunction. So while HIPAA is, is meant to really balance the protection of this, the information that gets transmitted to the doctor um, or the practitioner, um, largely because uh, policy reasons stand for that you want the, or the, the patient to be forthcoming with information. And so uh, protecting that information subject to the exception that if there's serious uh, imminent harm to either the patient or to another person, then disclosure is allowed. Again, it's permissive, not required. Um, there are also carve-outs in HIPAA where it allows for if there's consent that you can disclose to either the patient or the patient's representative. Um, and this is where, again, consent forms that come into play uh, prior to, to, to seeing the patient or, uh, you know, if needed afterwards. But, of course, um, getting the consent form earlier, I think, is, is a better practice. Um, that those disclosures still can be made for the betterment of the, the patient and also for the type of treatment that can be done to, to bring in the family and, to, um, and any representatives who may be able to guard against potential incidences um, and to make that disclosure um, as necessary. And so HIPAA, as you may or may not be familiar, is a federal statute now, there are state corollaries to the federal um, standard um, because HIPAA does not preempt states from passing their own laws. So um, as Matt mentioned at the, the top of the hour, um, of course, all the nuances of state law would apply. So 
um, to best, to, you know, consult a local practitioner who knows the nuances of each particular state um, in order to, to best guard you against um, potential liability um, in that respect. Thank you. Now, we've talked a lot here so far about kind of tort or common law bases for liability. Ben, I was hoping you could touch just briefly on statutory bases for liability, you know, that's different from kind of the case law approach. Sure. Um, so actually to, to talk about that, I'll jump off a case that I think you mentioned at the, the outset of this panel, uh, which was the, the late versus um, uh, Western psychiatry uh, case uh, resulted from a tragedy here, I think in 2012 in Pittsburgh, a uh, shooting at the uh, psychiatric hospital. Um, that case uh, did not involve a claim of common law negligence. That case only involved a claim under uh, the Pennsylvania Medical Mental Health Procedures Act. And that was really pivotal to the outcome of that case because that case turned uh, entirely really on the uh, statutory interpretation of that act. Um, that act required, uh, it, it provides uh, immunity for mental health practitioners and their decisions that they make with regard to whether or not to commit or not commit uh, a patient uh, to inpatient treatment um, so long as they make that uh, determination in good faith and they don't uh, exercise either uh, act with gross negligence or willful misconduct. Um, however, to trigger the provisions of that act, the statute requires that there have been an application to have been made uh, to uh, commit the patient, uh, and that never occurred in this particular instance. The doctors considered making the application, but they never actually made the application, and uh, per the statute, without uh, actually making that documentary filing, the statute and its provisions were not, did not come into play. And so the uh, claims of the, the patient uh, or the, uh, not the patient, the victims of the attack, uh, failed on that ground. Um, that might have turned out differently had they brought a common law negligence claim, uh, but, but they didn't. And so it's, it's a good example of not only should practitioners be aware of these more common law duties of, of uh, duty to warn and duty to protect and duty to control, um, well, in some states they're common law, in some states they're actually statutory because the, they have a, adopted a statute. But there are these other statutory regimes that they should also be aware of, uh, such as the Mental Health Procedures Act and, and so the, the requirements that uh, are imposed on practitioners and therapists by those statutory schemes. Thank you, Ben. Richard, I wanted to bring you into the conversation here. You know, in the wake of the tragedies at Stoneman Douglas High School in Buffalo, Uvalde most recently, you know, there has been a lot, um, a lot of discussion around what are called red flag laws. And I know that's an area that you have been involved with. Could you explain you know, what are red flag laws and how does that work with a health, health professional's disclosure obligations? Oh, sure. Um, but if I do, if I can just take one second before I do that. I just really want to give a big thanks to, to Ben and, and Stephanie um, and their firm, Carlton Fields. Carlton Fields has been our pro bono counsel now for a number of years and helped us navigate some very complicated legal issues in this emerging space. There are no clear answers in any of this space. So they've been just terrific, and I, and I thank you for that, and they've pledged to keep going. I think I'm now their biggest <laughs> client, and they're about a 1,000 lawyers. So. And we're happy for it. <laughs> so... Um, Red flag laws are an emerging methodology to try and remove guns from people who threaten imminent harm. Uh, they are a creature of state law. They are not a creature of federal law. They, the technical name of the laws go by the awkward acronym ERPO, which is an Extreme Risk Protection Order, and it's exactly that. An ERPO or a red flag law is triggered when either a mental health provider or some other person who is in a position to know about potentially dangerous and imminently dangerous actions by a gun owner, and they have a basis to know that, 
can report that information to the police, who can then make an emergency application to a court, much in the nature of a search warrant or an arrest warrant, and immediately remove those guns from the home. And then, depending on which state you're in, within 72 or slightly longer number of hours, there is a judicial proceeding where a court comes in and weighs the evidence uh, of, the, of the integrity of the information, the imminency of the harm, and whether or not the gun removal should be either permanent or retained for a certain period of time or given back to the gun owner. Um, this has, these laws have been kicking around in the gun control community for a while. We've been thinking about how to push them for a while. We tried in a couple of areas and it didn't work. And then finally, we, we broke through in New York and broke through in a couple of other states. And now they're really getting some momentum. And just to be really blunt about this, they're getting momentum because they don't smack of gun control politics. They, they are an emergency mechanism that empowers police to take immediate steps. So how does this interact with a mental health worker? I'm going to give you the example of New York because that's the body of law that I know the best. But again, this is emerging law. So there are no, there's no long line of cases about this. None of these things have been challenged yet. And there will certainly be a lot of litigation around this in the upcoming years. So in New York, a mental health worker in particular is empowered to call the authorities when he or she has a reason to believe that an individual poses an imminent threat. Um, a lot of mental health workers are, we train mental health workers throughout the state. A lot of them are now asking us whether or not the ability to call the police requires essentially the same level of evidence as the duty to warn. What triggers that duty to warn? Um, and I think that answer, again, there are no cases on this yet, but I think that the reasonable answer to that question is probably yes, that you probably need that amount of information before you make the call to the police and then the police make a decision about whether or not to go to the court and the court then makes a decision about whether or not to remove the weapons. The person that calls the police, in this case a mental health worker, that's most relevant to this discussion, then will be called to court to testify and, and give evidence to the court as to why he or she believed the gun should be removed. New York also has a provision where the mental health worker, him or herself, can make the application to the court. Let's say they call the police, and the local police say, don't think there's enough, the mental health worker is sufficiently alarmed, that mental health worker can make an application to the court. And that's a fairly simplified proceeding. There's, there are literally forms right online on the, the state court site that would guide the mental health worker through making that application. Um, and then the court would guide the mental health worker as to their obligations regarding the further proceeding. Um, we have seen in New York an interesting trend, which is this, and we've seen this in a number of other states, which is that police departments up until the Buffalo shooting, and I'll tell you exactly why, up until the Buffalo shooting have been reluctant to issue ERPOs, have been reluctant to go out and grab guns. It came out within a day or two after the Buffalo shooting that the shooter in that case had been reported to the police, and the police may have had an opportunity to seize weapons, and they, they chose not to do so. Um, the governor, went upon hearing that, issued a order to the state police, the state police report to the governor in New York, directing them to use ERPOs wherever applicable. So now there's been a huge surge in the number of ERPO cases that are now being executed, executed meaning the guns are going in and being taken out of the home. Then there's, again, a subsequent judicial hearing. Um, the ERPO the concept received a big boost when the federal government recently passed its latest gun control bill, the first bill in 25 years. And part of, the, of that bill urges states and provides states funding to set up state-level ERPO laws. And the reason the federal government chose to provide support and not mandate it is because the federal government probably lacks the jurisdiction to mandate under our federal system, lacks the constitutional power to direct the states to pass ERPO laws. But certainly the states have the power because states have what are called inherent police powers, which allow the states to pass a broad range of laws to protect public safety, essentially. Even the health laws come under police laws. So those are the ERPO laws in a, in a nutshell. Thank you, Richard. Ben, I wanted to move now to um, 
I know an area you've been focused on, which is the Safety Act. And if you could explain what is the Safety Act and how that might um, how that might provide a basis to protect health professionals, mental health professionals in particular, <clears throat> from potential liability risks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the Safety Act was passed in 2002 as part of the Homeland Security Act. Uh, it's it's very brief, really. It's only four statutes. Uh, it took up like uh, eight or nine pages of the uh, Homeland Security Act, which was a massive bill, um, and uh, was passed, it received very little attention uh, when it was first enacted and, and didn't was not well known uh, for a number of years uh, after it was passed. It's starting to get a little bit better known now. And in part, that's I think because it provides very significant uh, liability protections. The purpose of the Safety Act is to um, encourage uh, developers of what are known as qualified anti-terrorism technologies to develop and uh, utilize those technologies. And it does that by providing these uh, liability protections or limits on liability. A qualified anti-terrorism technology, uh, per the provisions of the Safety Act, is any product, device, or service uh, that can be utilized to uh, deter, detect, or reduce the amount of harm from an act of terrorism. Uh, in order to uh, benefit from the liability protections provided by the Safety Act, uh, a what in the terminology of the act that uses the word a seller, which is the developer or uh, user of the technology, um, must apply to the Department of Homeland Security and get a, a designation as a what I call a COT, a qualified anti-terrorism technology. Um, there are three levels of designation that a technology can uh, receive under uh, the Safety Act, and that's a DT&E uh, designation, which is Developmental Testing and Evaluation Technology. That's actually provided by the implementing regulations uh, for the Safety Act. A designated uh, technology or a certified technology. And those, those different designations provide uh, either different uh, levels of liability protection or uh, different uh, length of the uh, designation. So a DT&E technology uh, receives the protections from the Act for three to five years, and it's revocable uh, at any time. A designated technology uh, uh, benefits from the liability protections for five to eight years, and a certified technology uh, does not have a, a time limit. Uh, in addition, the certified technologies can benefit from what's known as the government contractor defense, which provides a rebuttable presumption uh, that they are completely immune from any liability. Technologies that receive the DTE or the designated uh, technology also receive very significant uh, liability protection in that they, uh, any action that is later brought in relation to the deployment of a COT um, cannot result in the award of punitive damages or prejudgment interest uh, to the uh, successful plaintiff, uh, assuming that there is a successful plaintiff. It also designates a upper limit, a cap, on the amount of liability that that uh, seller can be subjected to. Uh, so these are, are very, very significant. And the, the Act specifically provides that, even though it uses the word technology, it doesn't necessarily only refer to or apply to technology as we typically think of it, uh, but can also be uh, applied to services, uh, including uh, specifically, I uh, mentioned explicitly in the implementing regulations, um, threat assessments. Um, and so I, I think that there could be a good argument that were a organization or a therapist to develop a treatment program that was specifically designed with the purpose of detecting, deterring uh, terrorism or terrorist acts, that that program could uh, be designated under the Safety Act and benefit from some of these liability protections that it provides. Uh, if I may, we, uh, there are pro bono counsel. We've been talking about making the Crime Commission's DEEP program 
which is which completely fits this definition. We didn't do it with that, but it completely fits this definition as sort of a test case um, to see whether or not we can get it certified by DHS. Because if we can do that, I think that will then open up. I think it would open up a lot of protection to a lot of providers who are very understandably very nervous out there. Everything from very large urban hospitals to individual providers out in the rural areas. It's a, it's a frightening area. It's a financially frightening area. Um, and I think if we can get immunity from civil litigation, it will help a lot. Or, or even just a cap. Or even a cap. Even a cap. I mean, immunity would be great, uh, of course, but a cap also is significant. If you have a cap, then your insurance cost goes down because the insurance company knows what your exposure is. Right. Well, I want to be mindful of the time, especially because we are the last panel of the day and people want to stay no longer than they have to. Um, so with our remaining four minutes, let me just turn to each of you. And if you could, and Ben, I'll ask to start with you, then Stephanie, and then maybe, maybe Richard, you could close us out. You know, could you give the audience here today and online a, you know, a key takeaway when they think about risk viability or you know, something... Um, I know we've touched on the Safety Act, but something aspirational to work toward to help protect providers from the risks attendant in liability. Sure. Um, so going back a little bit to earlier in the panel when we were discussing the uh, duty to warn and the duty to protect, I, I think that it would be really beneficial if we could reduce some of the variability uh, that we see in that doctrine and how it's applied across the country. Um, it's difficult to uh, say what necessarily would be the best way to do that. Uh, there is no federal uh, law on this. It's all state law. And so uh, were you to enact a federal law, you would want to be careful that you don't just uh, put a new layer uh, of uh, duty to warn, duty to protect on top of the already pre-existing state laws. You would want, want it to supplant it so that you had a uniform um, standard. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that would be possible. So another route would potentially be, you know, promulgation of an advocacy for a uh, model law uh, around this, the country, uh, and hopefully more states enacting statutes that would conform to that model law, so as to reduce the variability and make it easier on practitioners to know what are their obligations. Thank you, Ben. Stephanie. I think it all starts with the practitioners themselves and coming together and understanding and perhaps developing codes of conduct, best practices, sharing amongst each other what is the best course when you receive information that perhaps you want to act upon. Um, developing different protocols for handling that information so that you're involving people who can help shield but also serve as a, as a sounding board for what type of disclosure, how to minimize um, not only the risk, but also disclosure of information that doesn't need to be disclosed. So balancing that. And then also it sort of dovetails with what Richard said is, is understanding and, and seeing what insurance is available. I, I think that goes hand in hand with what most practitioners or doctors know as malpractice insurance. Uh, but being mindful of that, uh, I think, is important as well. Um, I think there are a lot of things, but let me, let me hit two which have sort of been said in one way or another. One is, as people in this room, Brett, are helping to, and many of our colleagues actually, are helping to build out a consortium or a network of professional practitioners in this space, helping mental health uh, professionals come together, develop codes of conduct, develop ethical standards, uh, network with each other, expand the body of knowledge. I'm increasingly convinced, and Brett and I have chatted about this, that we probably should do the same thing in the bar. I think the bar needs to be better equipped to answer the kinds of questions the, the Bar Association of, of Lawyers. I think the, the bar needs to be better equipped to handle these sorts of questions and watch the emerging trends. There are not many practitioners that really look at these questions. When they started doing this, it was really work they were starting ab initio from the beginning. Um, it, it just doesn't come up that often. When you look for cases, there's a paucity of cases. There just aren't that many out there. The other is I do think we need to move on the Safety Act question. I think too many people are concerned out there about getting into an area where they otherwise would get into because of liability. I mean, we, we spend a lot of money on insurance every year. 
and I shouldn't have to, we're a small not-for-profit. I shouldn't have to do that. Particularly as the government's urging us to do this, by the way. As the government continues to urge us to do this, they need to have our backs. Thank you, Richard. And I want to thank our entire panel for traveling to Pittsburgh and for joining us here today. Thank all of you for joining us. Um, as a Pittsburgher myself, I hope you've had a good visit to our city. I wish you safe travels. Um, and we will officially end 10 seconds early. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>